Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057 Introduction to Law. This is week four of term two, 2019. Thank you very much for joining us live. We have quite a few people joining us live and we look forward to receiving some questions or if you wish, make some comments. You can unmute your microphone. If um, uh, you're not speaking, I'll just uh, ask you to mute your microphone just as a normal courtesy. Um, but please feel free to unmute the microphone if you wish to ask a question. And if you um, intend to um, use the chat facility, that's fine as well. Let's start by talking about Indigenous Australians. And if I could refer you to pages 89 through 94 of your text, there's some excellent commentary in relation to Indigenous Australians and the law. Now, the Australian customary laws were long standing and effectively operating for tens of thousands of years before British settlement. And of course, that was completely ignored in the early stages. Um, on page 91 of the text, you'll see that there's a reference there to Catherine Trees, who um, uh, did um, make the following comment. Catherine Trees highlights the inadequacy of language in failing to provide appropriate translations of the complexity and breadth of concepts that underpin the notion of customary, customary law. So in that sense, it is difficult to necessarily make proper assessments of what we mean when we refer to customary law. But what we can glean is that customary law does comprise of elements of law, spirituality, ceremony, and business. And again, that's referred to in the textbook and you'll see the footnote there, number 14, is a reference to some Indigenous legal issues in that regard. Uh, another complicating fact is that customary law was often kept secret. And different parts were known or preserved by initiated men or women or by small groups. That was to the exclusion of others, whereas the emphasis, of course, in British law is that the rule of law means that it should be publicly known. So there are completely different ways of approaching the law when one considers that which was the um, uh, British law as opposed to indigenous or customary law. Now, a very important decision, of course, is Mabo. And I'm sure you've all heard of Mabo. And um, that's a commentary you'll see in your text at page 93. So just a brief overview. In Mabo, the High Court considered a claim brought by the Merriam people. Um, it was actually by Eddie Marbo on behalf of the Merriam people, who, and the Merriam people had occupied the Murray Islands and the Torres Straits between Australia and Papua New Guinea um, for many years, uh, well before British settlement. Now in 1985, the Queensland government sought to resolve uncertainty as to the state's ownership of the islands. And what they did was enacted the Queensland Coast Islands Declaratory Act. And the purpose of the act was to establish uh, that any claims that might have been brought are effectively abolished so that the Murray Islanders could not make claim to ownership of those islands. Now, three islands, including Mabo, commenced legal action challenging the validity of the act and argued that it was contrary to the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975, which was a really interesting area, time in the law. And it's when I first came into the law in 76. So my first assessment at law school was on the Racial Discrimination Act. In any way, um, section 109 of the constitution was the section that was referred to in that case. And the argument was that, um, it was invalid um, as a result of looking at the constitutional requirements. The end result was that the Islanders were successful and to prevent any further attempts by the Queensland government to abolish any possible title, Marlborough brought a second legal action to have the rights of the Merriam people formally declared. So when we talk about the Marbo decision, we're actually talking about Marbo against the Queensland number two, meaning the second case. And the official citation is 1992, 175 CLR 1. And CLR is a reference to the Commonwealth Law Reports, which are 
the authorised reports in relation to Commonwealth legislation, sorry, case law. Now, following that, the Commonwealth Government passed the Native Title Act. That was in 1993, and essentially it created a legislative scheme for determining the existence of Native Title on land and validated past Commonwealth action in making land grants inconsistent with the property rights of Indigenous Australians. So it provided further authority. So bear in mind, of course, that the High Court, in a, an example of um, uh, judicial effectively lawmaking, um, judicial activism, as we call it, created this body of law and effectively put an end to the, to the legal fiction of terra nullius um, the Commonwealth Government then came in and supported that decision by making legislation, which was the Native Title Act. The next decision that was relevant was the Wick Peoples against the State of Queensland, where the court decided that a grant of a pastoral lease did not necessarily extinguish Native Title. So this decision in 1996 clarified some uncertainty, and the court found that the statutory pastoral leases under consideration by the court, did not bestow rights of exclusive possession on the leaseholders. Therefore, native title rights could coexist, but it depended on the terms of the pastoral lease. And where there was a conflict, the rights under the pastoral lease would extinguish the remaining Native Title Act. But the idea was that in relation to pastoral leases, as opposed to freehold, there was some certainty. And just to digress, when we talk about ownership of land, we tend to think of that which is freehold land. So in most of the urban areas, if you buy a block of land, you're buying freehold. But an alternative, which covers probably 40% of Australia's land mass, are what we call pastoral leases. So leasehold interests in a pastoral lease are separate to freehold but I digress. Now, as we've seen through the Mabo decision and the Native Title Act, the concept of terra nullius, that is the declaration by the British um, that Australia was unoccupied land became a legal fiction and no treaty was therefore seen to be necessary. And it was in 1992 with the Mabo decision that the High Court finally overturned the doctrine of terra nullius. I'm going to um, just digress for a moment to share something with you. And this is part of what I'd like you to complete as, if you like, informal homework during the week. Now, let me see if I've got the share correct. I'm not sure I do. Let me stop that share. Sorry, I have so many screens up on my um, thing. I will just try that again. Okay, so hopefully on your screen, you're seeing the landing page for the Supreme Court Library of Queensland. Is that what you're seeing? That's a yes? All right. Now, I do want you to go and have a look at the Supreme Court Library website. It's a fabulous website. And if you haven't been to the Supreme Court Library in Brisbane, please make an effort to go. It's a wonderful resource and try and find my favorite private reading room, which is number five. Um, and you'll see there that on the Supreme Court Library website, there's reference to some of the exhibits and the next one that comes up on the, um, Auto, auto scroll, well, I'll take, is likely to be, there it is, overturning terra nullius. And while we're at it, I'll just refer you to the podcasts because they're very interesting as well. And one of those relates to um, Mabo. So that's a podcast by Honourable Margaret White. And before that, there was a podcast on Mackenzie. And sometimes you'll hear about this, the Mackenzie friend. Now, Rachel, you first, I think, alerted us to the benefits of the Supreme Court Library and the um, exhibit. I'm putting you on the spot here, but do you want to 
tell us more about that? I didn't actually get a chance to go. Okay. Um, because we're in the process of moving offices at the moment, so things are a little bit crazy. Um, but yet we regularly get the Law Society updates, and I just happened to have come across one and saw and saw that, and I was like, "Oh, that'd be really interesting." And I was really hoping to be able to go, but just unfortunately, just didn't make it there. And and thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate that. Um, and I haven't had an opportunity to see the exhibit either. Has anyone been to see the exhibit? Or can I just ask this? Has anyone been to the Supreme Court Library to have a look? You can say no. You can just put yes or no, no, not yet. All right, all good intentions, but I'm sure that you will get there. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you for everyone else. Um, Gary, what are, what are your thoughts on the recent High Court decision on compensation being paid for native title and how does it sit with pastoral leases? Oh, I'm not sure I can answer that one on the run. Sorry, Gary. But it's a good question. Please feel free to ask that in Q&A if you would. Um, all right, so Deborah says no, but she will go and see the Supreme Court Library by the end of the month. Excellent. Well, thank you. So that's a very brief overview of the law relating to Indigenous Australians, Mabo, Wick, native title, please ensure that you follow up with the reading on that and read a little more widely as we've discussed. Let's um, just digress for a moment. Now, by this stage, I would hope that you have done the following. Number one, committed to reading in advance. So it's not just a matter of reading up to this week. I want you to read in advance. And you've probably noticed that I quite intentionally jump around the textbook and ask you to consider this chapter or that chapter in this material. So reading in advance means two things. Number one, looking at the entire document. In this case, I'm talking about, when I say the document, I'm talking about your textbook and getting a feel for it and extracting material, but also reading the prescribed chapters. So in week four, you should certainly be reading week five and possibly week six material. So reading in advance. Again, I'm just going to digress for a moment. One of the reasons that I want you to look at the entire document is it's part of your legal training. When we look at a statute, it's very important that you don't simply go to a section and read it in isolation. The modern approach to statutory interpretation is that you consider the entire context of the legislation and you then look at the specific section within that context. So in order to get an idea of the context, you need to have an overview, a flyover of all the legislation, look at the chapters, look at the headings, get a feel for it, and then you can narrow in and look at the specific section. But I digress. So that's number one thing you should be doing by now, reading in advance and looking at this big picture before you start to zero in on specific content. Number two, you should by now have thoroughly looked at the Moodle site and you should have a very good idea of what's involved in the unit. Now, when I mean looking at the Moodle site, I mean opening every part of every page, every section. Um, the Moodle site that I've created, I've tried to keep it really quite simple so that you've got clear headings. And if you open that heading into that section, you can see a number of documents. You probably haven't had time to look at all of the documents, but I want you to at least get a feel for it and then start to look at some of the specific documents. And I'm getting a thank you for the way in which it's set out. So thank you, Emily. Um, so make sure that you've thoroughly looked through Moodle. It would be embarrassing if you asked a question about something which is on Moodle and it's therefore obvious that by asking the question, you haven't actually looked. I don't want to discourage questions. Please ask. Um, there's no wrong question or but just make sure that you do some background research before you ask the question if you think it's on um, Moodle. Next is have a look at the assessment pieces, work out how to upload. Many of you have uploaded your first assessment. 
Thank you very much for doing so. If you haven't, make sure that you upload your assessment on time and um, that means working out the way in which to do that. I'm very pleased to see we've got so many people that know how to use the technology for Zoom sessions and join us for the live sessions every week, so that's great. You should also have mapped out a study plan, so what that means is looking at the end objective and then working back from there. Finally, you should have looked at the sample document that I prepared, which I think I called materials um, uh, for assessment pieces, but I'll just share it with you. I think I've shown you this already. It's, there's no great magic in this document, but it's, it's reasonable. So that's what I call the sample document, and it will give you some idea of the way in which you should write legal material. You'll see that we use headings, subheadings. We use most definitely footnote referencing, which is part of the Australian Guide to Legal Citations version four. And you'll see that that's footnoted down the bottom. Footnoting is really simple. Just go to the Word program, look at references on the toolbar, and then click insert footnote. It's really very simple. Follow some of the basic rules by osmosis, by looking at this document, by looking at your text, by looking at the way in which cases um, are written. You'll see that when we refer to a case or the names of the litigants in a case, they're, ita they're italicized. Likewise, when you're looking at legislation, it's in italics. Also think about the way in which quoted material is referred to and you'll see that it's indented. Um, for the most part. Also consider the content and short sentences. So Lord Denning started a judgment in this way, and this is in Thornton against Shoe Lane Parking. The customer pays his money and gets a ticket. He cannot refuse it. He cannot get the money back. He may protest to the machine, even swear at it, but it remains unmoved. It's just brilliant writing, short sentences, very direct, um, written in the active rather than passive voice and in, uh, written it in an engaging manner. Um, in another decision by Lord Denning, he goes into longer sentences and he uses a variety of um, pace. He use, move, moves the pace around. So I'll leave you to read that um, at your leisure to give you an idea of what I think is excellent writing. And that was from Miller and Jackson. Okay, well, I'll stop the share there. So that's just a document that's created and on the Moodle site. All right, any questions? I know I'm moving fast, but I'm sure you're all keeping up with me. Any questions? Evie, do you have a question? No? I'll just mute your microphone. All right. So, with your first assessment, many of you have presented your work, thank you. If you do need to apply for an extension, you need to apply before the assessment is due, that's a general rule for the university. But bear in mind that granting um, an assessment extension is considered a significant concession to the students. And there are some acceptable reasons for requesting an extension, but there are many unacceptable reasons for requesting an extension. Acceptable is basically through medical issues or hardship issues. What's unacceptable to ask for an extension is because of commitments that have arisen that are predictable or normal or minor tensions or usual demands of employment or workplace or family life, including periods of pressure and circumstances that are within your ability to control. Bear in mind that with my assessment work, I usually produce it at the start of the semester. So the obvious answer to any request would be, you've known about this for four weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, um, because you're busy this week, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have been able to do much of the work prior to that. So please keep all of that in mind.
And remember that if you apply for an extension, you need to have appropriate documentary evidence to support your request. Now, in a way, all of that's a lot of work, isn't it? So I've got a great solution. Don't apply for the extension, just get the work done on time. Is that okay? Easy enough? Um, there's gonna be a dynamic, you will feel the pressure and part of the pressure will be, um, I need more time because I'm just not happy with my work. Now, when you're practicing in law, you have to understand that sometimes you go with what you've got. It may not be your best work, but it might be better than you actually think. And sometimes people stress too much and you've got to maintain a, a balance here. And it's all part of resilience to be in a position to get your work in on time. Judges expect it, so we expect it too. Are there any questions about what I've just said in relation to applying for extensions, getting you work in on time? And I'm not suggesting near enough is good enough, but I'm just saying sometimes people really stress too much about their work. All good? Okay. What you can be doing is working on having some study groups Try and create some connection with your fellow students. For many of you um, undertaking the LLB program, you'll be working together for three, four, five years. So good to make some associations now. Um, all right. Let's go to page 287 of your text. D don't you love the way I do this? I just jump all around the place. We talked about the ERAC Iraq method last time. So can anyone remind me what we mean by the IRAC method? What does it stand for? What does it mean? What is an example of? IRAC, it's on page 287 of your text. What's all that about? Gary says, issue, rule, application, conclusion. Yes, Rachel, and Suzanne came in with the same response just after Gary. Gary says it's to do with method. And it's a, you'll see from the textbook that it's a, a form of legal, Emily says, problem solving. Yes, it is, Chris says, identify the legal rule, the, uh, the issue, then the rule, apply the rules to the facts and state the conclusion. It's a form of legal reasoning, isn't it? This is the logical way that lawyers think about things. There are variations. I prefer MIRAC, which means the material facts, and then we look at the issues, the rules, applying the rules and the conclusion. <coughs> Another variation is CMIRAC, which is where you state the conclusion, then the material facts, then the issues, the rules, apply and conclusion. So there are different ways of doing this. Um, but they're all basically the same. They're just slight variations to it. Why on earth would you state the conclusion first and then at the end as well? Any idea why you would do that? Why would you play around with the Iraq? Working to an end statement, clarity. To summarise and give the reader an outcome early. Their responses from Glyn, Paul and Gary respectively, and they're all very good. Samara says to get a clear idea of direction. Catherine says important to have an idea of outcomes during the process. All good responses. If I'm making a submission in court, I'll often give the judge um, an idea of what I believe to be the appropriate conclusion from the outset so that the judge knows what I'm working towards. It also provides an opportunity for immediate feedback. Sometimes the feedback is positive, as in, yes, I'm with you on that, keep going. Sometimes it's negative, and depending on the nature of the response, it may be that you're really gonna be struggling, um, or it may be 
I don't think so, but keep talking type response. Of course, what we always like from a practical perspective is to state the conclusion, get the, you've got to be joking, but then ultimately through your submission and, the, and your work, turn it around so that you get what you want. That's always nice feeling if you can. But, and Timothy says, you might do that to tie all the work together. So come up with an idea of what works for you, but work around that central theme of legal reasoning to determine the key issues, the rules, apply those rules to the facts and state the conclusion. I would recommend that you don't slavishly use that formula in answering every legal problem. So by the time you're in second or third year in law, if for those students that are continuing on in law, you can use that technique if you want with actual headings. I'd recommend against it and have that legal reasoning in mind, but provide a more fluent response rather than a stilted response of necessarily saying, here is, here is the, um, the set out. I hope that makes some sense. Some people much prefer to stick with that tri tried and uh, tested formula all the time, but I like to see some flexibility around it. But have it in mind as your overall legal reasoning. Now, can anyone tell me if they have looked at the Australian Guide to Legal Citations or have done some reading on the AL, I'm sorry, AGLC, and whether they've kind of got an idea of what it means. So we're getting some responses here. Oh, lots of yeses. Good. It is important. Um, and Evie says, I've, I've actually given it a shot in the assessment. Great. So if you haven't already, you must this week have a look at the Australian Guide to Legal Citations and get an idea of some of the highlights. Look, I'll mention some of the highlights now. Um, one is um, you must use footnote referencing. So you don't reference in the body of the material, it must be footnotes like the sample documents, like you'll see in case law, like you see in the textbook. The next thing is that just be aware of where your footnote superscript, the, the little tiny number fits and it goes after the relevant punctuation in the text. So it might be sentence, comma, and then you have the superscript, um, ends, full stop, and then you have the superscript. Does that make sense? All right. Samara says, there's a laminated sheet in the CQ library for $10, it's really good. There you go. So um, understand footnote referencing, and get an idea of where the superscript, you know, the little number, where that goes, and it should be after the relevant punctuation. The next thing, basic thing is bibliographies are not included. So when we're dealing with the Australian Guide to Legal Citations, no bibliography. If someone asks, should I have a bibliography for this assessment? That probably suggests that they haven't seen this Zoom session or didn't participate or haven't read the AGLC or both. I actually don't like this, but we do use IBID as a reference, um, um, as a, a way of referencing. Does anyone know what IBID means? That's I-B-I-D. Rachel says, as above. That's it, referencing, reference to the reference above. EBID, I don't like it, but it is part of the AG, Australian Guide to Legal Citations. So EBID is the way in which you reference, you actually type in that word, I-B-I-D. Um, it's used to refer to a source in the immediately preceding footnote. So if you've referred to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, 1999, Commonwealth, comma, S, 27, full stop, in one footnote, and then you're referring to section three of that same act in the next footnote, the reference would be IBID, comma, S3, full stop. So you don't repeat the legislation, you use the word IBID. Okay, have a look at that. Look at that. 
If you're referring to a case, use the authorised report. So we referred to a case earlier tonight, Marbo, and I said that's the authorised report. So when you're reading cases or you're looking at citations for cases, you'll see that there's a reference to the report. So Marbo was part of the CLR series, which is the Commonwealth Law Reports. That's part of the authorised reports. Others are the FCR, the federal um, reports, the QDRs or the Queensland reports, and so on. There are unauthorised reports, and you can use the unauthorised reports, but basically do that if the authorised report is not available. Okay. And do know about pinpoint referencing, which is a reference to the page and generally the paragraph number where available. So if you're referring to, um, say, the Marbo decision and you're quoting from it, it would be inappropriate, it would be insufficient to simply put a footnote reference, Marbo against the Commonwealth. You need to identify the page or better still, the paragraph number, which is what we call pinpoint referencing. All good? They're just some of the basics of the Australian Guide to Legal Citations. But do try and find um, something that will give you a quick reference to it. Now, um, Samara's raised a really good point, and it, it is an exception that I do make. If you have an invigilated examination, and by that I mean a, an old fashioned pen and paper, two hours start. Um, with a perusal, write for two hours and then pens down, I don't, I don't expect footnote referencing in that context. That's an exception. You can use a reference in the body of the text, a bit like Harvard referencing. You know, um, terra nullius is now not, is, is no longer part of the Australian law. Open brackets, Marbo, close brackets would be sufficient for my purposes in an invigilated examination. If it's a take home paper where you've got 29 hours, I would expect you to put in pin, uh, footnote referencing and comply with the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. Good question, Samara, thank you for that. All right, am I going too fast or we're fine? We're keeping up? Legislation and common law, we talked about that last week. When we talk about legislation, we're talking about acts of parliament. Common law is essentially judge made law. And when we talk about legislative lawmaking, sometimes really three levels, aren't there? Number one is the federal parliament. Number two, state and territory parliaments. And number three, local councils. Local councils derive their power to make laws through delegation of lawmaking ability. So the Australian Parliament and the Australian Government are actually not the same thing. People tend to think of them as being the same. The Australian Parliament consists of the Queen, which is represented by the Governor General, the Senate and the House of Representatives at a Commonwealth level. So Parliament makes laws, provides a place where the government is formed, and the Australian government is formed by the party or coalition of parties that support a majority of members in the House of Representatives. So Parliament is different to the government. Um, so you, you need to understand that in the context of the separation of powers. Let's look at page 125 of your text, and you'll see that um, there is figure 4.25, which, sorry, 4.2 on page 125, I'm just flicking towards it now. And that's the structure of the Australian Constitution. So that is the parliament, the executive government and the judicature. So we have the separation of powers identified there. And you'll see that that is from the Australian Constitution. So this Separation of powers derives from what is in the Constitution. 
and they are, all three of them, are collectively called the arms of government. So the judiciary is separate, but there is a crossover between the legislature and the executive. So there's some sharing of powers between the parliament and the executive. That's mostly to do with ministerial powers and ministerial involvement. So it's not a true separation, but the judiciary is quite separate and guards itself as being jealously separate in that sense. All right, any questions about that? All good? Thank you. Um, I'll just share the screen. So you will see there um, from the Parliamentary Office website, a flowchart, a very simple diagrammatic representation of Australian law, Parliament making a law, the executive administering the law and the judiciary reading the Act of Parliament and determining whether people are guilty or not guilty in relation to certain things. So often the officers of the executive are those people that enforce the laws or make decisions around specific matters involving the law. That's a really basic guide. And while we're at it, we'll just have a look at this. If you want some information about how to read legislation, the Parliamentary Council's Office of Western Australia have an excellent publication, How to Read Legislation, A Beginner's Guide, and I'd commend that to you. I'll stop the share now. Okay, so bills, B-I-L-L-S. What do we mean by a bill? Oh, Emily said, I found it. it's a good beginner's guide. So thank you, Emily. Um, We've, you'll hear this term a bill and you'll hear the term an act. So a bill, can you hear me okay? Apparently my microphone is all good now. Okay, thank you. So um, a bill is something which is a proposal to change a law. And once it's been through the appropriate process, it may become law which means that it becomes an act of parliament. So when it comes to understanding these things and the way in which law is made and the role of individual people, then you might consider some basic information on some websites. So for example, the Parliament of Australia website has some excellent material, info sheets to make it nice and simple. Parliament of Australia, Commonwealth, House of Representatives info sheets gives a really basic idea of what people do. And over on the right hand side, you'll see practice, sorry, powers, practice and procedure. And I'd look at that as well. So do find that for yourself, Parliament of Australia, about Parliament and the work of the Parliament in this instance I've brought up the House of Representatives. Another thing that you could consider is the legislation handbook, which is something published through the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. It's available in Word or PDF, and it's an excellent publication to provide a description of the procedures involved in making Commonwealth Acts and um, there's an option even to listen to that material. Beyond that, under the Parliament of Australia website, you'll see some information in relation to um, an overview of bills, as we've been discussing, and some really good material in terms of the parliamentary library. So do spend some time just flicking through that website and you'll find some excellent material, I'm sure. 
One of the things that you might come across is the Bills Digest. And this is through the um, Parliament of Australia. The one that I've selected there as a sample is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Bill, 1998. And you'll see that it provides a background in relation to that piece of legislation and how it came together. While you're looking through the website, you'll see some excellent educational resources, parliamentary overview, and I'd recommend the Parliamentary Education Office and the flowchart that I sh showed you earlier derived from that um, Parliamentary Education Office. So it's a good way of sourcing easy to read and highly authoritative material that will assist you. And you'll see down the bottom there, publications as well. From a Queensland perspective, we have the Queensland Parliament website, again, provides you with information about the way in which Parliament um, undertakes its business. And of course, we don't have a Senate in Queensland, so we've only got the lower house. If you're undertaking this unit from a different jurisdiction, then don't confine yourself to just Queensland. Have a look at um, your own state or territory. And finally, um, going back to the Office of the Parliamentary Council in the Australian Government, I'm going to recommend that you consider looking at the legislation handbook, um, which I, th I think I may have mentioned earlier. So there's some very good resources there. If you find some resources that you particularly like, then share the information and um, let us all know. So if you think that something is a terrific resource, share it through Q&A or through um, some of the means. What you need to do is understand the difference between the powers for the federal parliament and the state parliaments. We talked about that previously and you'll need to be aware of um, section 51, setting out the concurrent heads of power. Um, I take it by now everybody's had a look at section 51, but also look at sections 52, 90, um, 114, 115, and 122. And better understand the separation of powers that we've talked about. Well, let's give an example now of the way in which legislation overrides case law. I gave one, I hinted an example earlier this evening when I talked about Mabo and the Native Title Act. So after the Mabo decision, had the federal government not liked the decision of the High Court, then we might have had legislation that was entirely different to the Native Title Act. So whereas the Native Title Act embraced and regulated the decision that was essentially made in Mabo, the Commonwealth could have gone a different way and overridden that decision. It didn't, fortunately, but it could have. So when Parliament makes laws, it may do so in an attempt to create some brand new law. And in the process of creating this law, it may be seeking to override case law that had been previously made by judges. Have a look at a case of Ridgeway against the Queen. It's 1995, 184 CLR 19. So what happened was this, Ridgeway was participating in a, what's called a controlled importation of heroin into Australia was a tip-off and he was arrested uh, as a result of this tip-off. And what had happened is that the authorities allowed the informer who, was, who provided the tip-off to pass through customs um, uninhibited and the informer delivered the heroin to Ridgeway and then Ridgeway was arrested. The High Court quashed the conviction and ordered a permanent stay of proceedings. And what happened is that the court recognised a judicial discretion in criminal proceedings to exclude evidence on public policy and where the commission of the offence was procured by unlawful conduct, 
on behalf of law enforcement officers. That is, they allowed the informant to pass through customs with heroin with their knowledge, which was essentially, according to the High Court, an illegal act. So they said that anything that follows from that is unlawful and Ridgeway was therefore, um, the conviction was overturned. So what did Parliament do in that instance? Well, Parliament inserted Section 15X in the Crimes Act 1901 to permit law enforcement officers to engage in what they called controlled operations to, in, to obtain evidence against a person who was involved in a serious state or commonwealth offence. So when you read a decision by a court, you need to consider whether in fact, Parliament has in essence overturned that decision as a result of subsequent um, enactments. The other thing that you need to consider is this difference between the common law or law and equity. And we referred to this last week briefly. So have a look at page 99 of your text for that distinction between common law and equity. Get a feel for the background circumstances. You'll recall that I, we talked about the Lord Chancellor filling in for the King or Queen and creating its essentially his own court making decisions based on equity and good conscience. And as a result of that, a number of equitable principles came into existence. One is um, one who comes into equity must come with clean hands. In other words, if you're asking for a fair result, then you've got to have, you must establish that you've acted fairly in the first place. So the purpose of that particular equitable maxim is to protect the integrity of the court. Um, so courts will not condone illegal acts and therefore they'll deny relief for someone who has exhibited bad behaviour, bad conduct to the point where it should be discouraged. A little bit like the principle behind Ridgeway, which was not an equitable principle, but you get the idea. So sometimes when you're looking at a legal question, you need to ask yourself, is this overall situation something that might be modified as a result of applying equitable principles to this problem? It gets a bit complicated, it gets a bit messy. So unfortunately, when you're answering a legal question, there's not one source of information that provides an answer. The answer that you might give to a legal problem may be an amalgam of considering legislation, case law, and equitable principles. As a result of that, when we have arguments in court, it may be that people look at the particular problem and therefore pose an answer to that problem from different perspectives. I hope that makes some sense. So um, do think about that always when you're looking at a legal question. Okay, so um, let's look at, I'm just panning ahead now so we can move quickly through material. Uh, let's look at a concept that you'll come across called the crown. Has anyone come across this concept, the crown? And does anyone want to tell me what the crown means? It's a bit obscure, but it's very common, referred to a lot, the crown. What does that mean in, in the context of our law? Any takers? Okay, so Rachel says state or federal government. Gary says it's essentially the government. Rebecca, the Commonwealth. Suzanne says against the Commonwealth. All right, 
let me look at it this way. I can't, I can't give you a definite answer on this. I can't give you a specific definition of the crown, but I can try to explain it to you. Um, and that Catherine says the government as a complainant. All right, so we know what a government means now. Governments are elected as a result of an election forms a government. And governments come and go, don't they? But the Crown always remains. So the Crown is an institution in Australian law. Governments come and go depending on an election. So head of state, kind of, yes. Um, what you'll find is that all land and natural resources in, in Australia, which are subject to native title, um, of course, as we've discussed tonight, they all derive from the Crown. So it's not from government because governments come and go, but this crown, this institution in Australian law is from what all land and natural resources derive. And title to land and resources that have not been transferred to private ownership remains with the crown, this institution. I mentioned earlier the distinction between freehold land and pastoral lease, leasehold. What people don't necessarily realise that if you buy a block of freehold land, you don't actually own the land entirely. Because if you look at a title deed, which says, you know, Mary Bloggs is the owner of this parcel of land, you'll see that there are some reservations. And the reservations relate to typically to resources. So you don't necessarily own what's below. Um, that can be subject to a mining lease, for example. So the Crown may have some reservations um, on freehold land. Now, in Australia, we talk about the Crown, but in non-monarchies, the concept which we attribute to the Crown might be referred to, say, in America as the state or the people. It's the same kind of concept. It means this sort of global thing. The Crown is not the government, as I mentioned before, but the government is responsible for the affairs of the Crown. And sometimes you'll hear or you'll read about legislation expressed to bind the Crown. What it means is that the institutions of government must comply with that legislation. So Rebecca says the people, yes, that's, what, that's pretty much what it is. Sorry, that I hope that provides you with some idea of the distinction between the Crown and the government. Okay, um, case law. We understand that the hierarchy applies. Have a look at page, I think it's 171, and you'll see the federal court hierarchy. We may have looked at that previously. That's figure 5.5. .5. If you're reading from an older version of the new lawyer, often the figures um, might be on different pages, but the figures have the same number. So this is 5.5. .5. Then have a look at um, 5.6, which is on page 176. Um, sorry, no, it's not. 5.6 is on 174, which provides some idea of the state and territory court hierarchy. So generally speaking, what we need to do is think about the quality of the decision in terms of its ability to bind others. In short, if a magistrate makes a decision, a ruling of law, the principles that go behind that decision will not be binding on the Supreme Court, but the reverse applies. If the Supreme Court makes a ruling a decision of a legal principle, then subject to the facts being the same, that legal principle will bind a magistrate. So you might hear, in, if you went to a magistrate's court, you might hear a magistrate saying, well, I'm, I'm bound to proceed on this basis as a result of um, high court authority or court of appeal authority, um, which is in the state jurisdiction. I'll just ask, has anyone, been to say the magistrate's court or the district court or the Supreme Court and actually looked at proceedings. 
just a yes, no. Have you been and you checked it all out? We're getting a lot of yeses. If you haven't, please do so. Um, you don't have to go for long. Um, oh, someone was actually a juror, so that's, that's a good way of seeing close up. But do go along and have a look at the way in which it works in practice. A busy call over day in the magistrate's court is really something to watch. It moves very fast and um, usually you can introduce yourself to some of the people involved and you might even get to, to meet, say, the magistrate. All right, um, so coming back to case law, we've mentioned that some cases are reported, some are unreported, some are authorised, some are not authorised. Okay, so the reported decisions are those that are in the law reports, but sometimes, confusingly, unreported decisions you can actually find in the Supreme Court Library um, material as well. All good? I know I'm moving fast. Um, do have a look at the monetary jurisdictions that apply in relation to certain matters. But just remember, um, say in QCAT, whilst there's a common misconception, I think it's even in the, um, even in the textbook gets it wrong, um, that people think it's $25,000. In some instances in QCAT, it's unlimited. In some of the instances, it's as per the district court scale. So for example, a retail shop lease dispute heard in QCAT, the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, is subject to a jurisdictional limit of $750,000. So there's the minor civil disputes jurisdiction, which is the old small claims tribunal, which is one of the tribunals that was wrapped up in QCAT. That still has this $25,000 limit, but that's one of 29 tribunals that were wrapped up into QCAT. For the others, it's basically unlimited um, unless it's, so retail shop lease, which is 750. Okay, so just get an idea of what these jurisdictional limits are and do try to work out what um, each of these courts and tribunals will hear. So in other words, if you are chasing a debt, then you may be entitled to chase that debt in a tribunal or a court, and you've got to make a decision as to which way to go. Um, sometimes there is material in the legislation that says, if you bring an action in this court or tribunal, it might be subject to a transfer to a more suitable jurisdiction. So if you go to the Supreme Court chasing a $200 debt, don't be surprised if fairly quickly, there's an application for it to be transferred to a more suitable jurisdiction to hear the matter. All good? All right. Um, I'll just finish by saying some brief notes about introduction to criminal trial procedure and introduction to civil trial procedure. So when we talk about civil, we're talking about that which is not criminal. And when we're talking about criminal, we're talking about that which is not civil. I hope that makes sense. So in a legal dispute, the threshold question might be, is this a criminal law matter or is this a civil law matter? And I guess usually it's pretty obvious which one it is. So what happens in criminal trial procedures? Well, the first thing is that there will be something that might happen and there is sometimes civil and criminal can, can cross over, absolutely. So in criminal law procedures, the first thing you must bear in mind is that before there's an arrest or even after arrest, defendants have a right to silence. That's a, that's a, um, a common law right, which can be overtaken by specific legislation. For example, compulsive hearings in the uh, Crime and Corruption Commission or the Australian Crime Commission, um, the legislation may provide that you don't have a right to silence in that jurisdiction for certain procedures, but generally speaking, you have a right to silence. Once you're arrested, um, you are brought before a court, and the first thing that the court will normally consider is whether or not you should be granted bail. <clears throat> bail does not necessarily mean the payment of money, 
what it means is, um, can you be released from custody pending the next court matter? It, it may be that it's subject to a surety, which is payment of money, but it doesn't have to be. So bail is this process. An alternative is to give someone a notice to appear. So they might be arrested and brought before a magistrate, or they may be given a notice to appear in order to have it put before the magistrate's court. One of the threshold questions that you need to understand is the jurisdictional determination. So is it Commonwealth or is it state? So is it a Commonwealth offence? Is it a state offence? <clears throat> is it a summary matter or indictable? When you hear that term indictable, it really means that which is presented by way of indictment in the higher courts. Um, but confusingly, some indictable offences can or even must be dealt with summarily. When we, talk, when we say summarily, we mean in front of a magistrate. <coughs> Sorry. And the courts that usually deal with issues to do with Commonwealth matters, or crime matters rather, are the Magistrates Court, the District Court and the Supreme Court. Matters can proceed to sentence. When we talk about a sentence, that's a plea of guilty or a finding of guilt or a trial. And trial or hearing means not guilty and determination. Excuse me, my voice is going. Which probably means that it's time to wrap up and we can do a brief overview of civil trial procedure next week when my voice has recovered. Okay. Are there any questions? Um, Gary says, is there a statute of limitation for civil matters? Yes, generally there is. So please look at the statute of limitations. Generally, there is no statute of limitations for criminal matters, but there might be um, in some summary matters. So Evie says, what's the opposite of indictable? The answer is summary is generally the opposite of indictable. So a matter is either determined summarily or by indictment. And if it's indictable, it means it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the subject of an indictment, which is presented in the district or the Supreme Court, but it's the sort of offence that may be subject to that. As I said, confusingly after the Moynihan reforms in 2010, some indictable matters must be dealt with summarily. But it's Am I allowed to say this? It's essentially a, a cost saving exercise because running district court, Supreme Court trials are very expensive. But generally speaking, as a category of that which is um, a summary offence as opposed to that which is an indictable offence. All right, no other questions? Thank you very much. Um, Lucy says, just on the assessment, is there a word limit of 1,200 words for our assessment. I've seen a couple of different word limits. With the first assessment, I think it's more indicative. I don't think there is actually a word limit as such. All right. All good? Thank you. We'll see you next week. All the best. Bye then.